Hi everyone, I hope you're all enjoying the last of your summers. I for one have been soaking up the sun here while I still can. Welcome to the August edition of our State of the Consumer series. And this month we're going to be taking a look at purpose-driven brands, both what consumers expect out of their purpose-focused products and what brands can do to approach sustainability with, well, a purpose. <laughs> So for anyone out there who I haven't had the chance to meet before, I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer here at Suzy. And who is Suzy? We are an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform that combines quant, qual, and high-quality audiences into a single connected research cloud to help companies grow through customer obsession. So for the first part of today's webinar, we're going to take a look at a survey that we ran on Suzy on August the 3rd to a sample size of a thousand consumers. And that sample, of course, was census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. And throughout the presentation, you're going to see stats, examples of brands that are living up to a purpose-driven ethos, and some thought starters for your own brands. And at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna invite you to stick around for our two very special guest speakers. I'm gonna be joined by Emily Hazlitt, Senior Director of Brand Marketing at Genexa, and Lizzie Horvitz, founder at Finch. They're gonna share learnings from their own brands, baking some advice for today's audience, and they're gonna answer your questions live. So please drop those questions into the chat throughout today's presentation, and we'll answer as many as we can get to. All right, so let's get into the data. So to start out with the obvious, aligning with a purpose can be a very powerful thing. And there's so much proof of this across the media. People prefer brands aligned with their corporate purpose and values. And 82% of consumers want a brand's values to align with their own. And brand values really impact consumer preference. And there's so many articles on this and studies that can attest to exactly this topic. And the article that you see on the screen here is just a small sample. And since 70% of consumers are more likely to purchase purpose-driven brands, it is important for brands to consider how they align with purpose. So what does this mean for CPG brands? And what do conscious consumers want to see from brands in this space? So in this portion of the webinar, we're going to answer those questions and do a deep dive into two particularly important topics and brands areas for brands to consider, which is sustainability and the word clean. So first of all, we're going to start with sustainability. 54% of consumers are actively seeking out sustainable products. And the top three categories that they're looking for these types of products in are cleaning products at 67%, groceries also at 67%, and hair care at 57%. And cleaning products in particular are seeing a really high demand for sustainable and eco-friendly options. And one of the articles on screen that was particularly interesting is said that eco-friendly cleaning products are becoming a trendy item to have in the home. And people are talking about these products on social media and showing off aspirational brands like Method around their homes. It's also the great packaging. We're also seeing a rise in trendy cleaning products popping up on social media platforms like TikTok and the hashtag clean talk, one of my personal favorites. So when it comes to why people want to shop sustainably, there are loads of reasons. So let's dive in from sustainable products being better for the environment to being safer for the family, to wanting to support companies doing good things, to wanting to preserve water, to protecting animals and more. The reasons really go on and on. But really the absolute number one priority is the planet. And if we double click even further into the top reasons that people are buying sustainable products, it's because they're safer for the environment. And it makes people feel that they are doing their part to preserve the planet and they want to protect the environment for future generations. And interestingly, consumers are more likely to care about tangible elements of sustainability, all the things that they can actually feel and experience much more directly. So when we ask people about the elements of sustainability that they care about the most, what rose to the top were the human elements and waste. So people are most concerned about both products being safe to consume and the type of waste that they're then going to produce. On the other hand, things that really fell to the bottom 
were water and raw materials. So how much water and fossil fuels go into actually making the product was really not that much of a concern, likely due to a lack of knowledge or a lack of understanding. And what's interesting here is that the elements that consumers were least concerned about are the parts of the production process that happen well before items even reach the buyers. And what this means is that consumers are more interested in the impact a product will have on them and what will happen to it at the end of its life. And they aren't as interested in how it was produced because they, since they didn't really see that part, they may not feel as responsible for it. So our thought starter here is that brands should focus just as much on products future as they do on the past and how it came to be. So often we see things like made from recycled materials and other similar messaging. And while that's of course still incredibly important to sustainability efforts, consumers are asking more so what's gonna happen at the end of the product's life when it's time to get rid of it. And a good example of a brand that does this really well is Sprout. So they've developed the world's only plantable makeup liner. Where there are other brands that have, may have liners made out of recyclable material, sorry, recycled materials, or offer messaging around ways to sustainably dispose of the products, this liner has a simple instruction. Just put it in the ground and plant it. And giving consumers a tangible way to be sustainable is important because shopping sustainably really isn't easy. One of the most difficult things about shopping sustainably is trying to find genuinely sustainable brands. So when we looked at the data, this was the number two thing that people found most difficult about shopping sustainably behind just cost. And finding genuinely sustainable brands can be a really hard task at times, especially as greenwashing is still rife across companies. So for those unfamiliar with this term, to put it simply, greenwashing is when a company promotes themselves or certain products as environmentally friendly for marketing purposes without actually making the sustainability efforts to back up their claims. And since there isn't really a ton of regulation around this, it's easy just to slap a green sheen on products to generate appeal. And according to recent articles, nearly three quarters of corporate leaders, anonymously I assume, say that organizations in their industry will be caught greenwashing if it were to be investigated thoroughly. And one example of a company that came under scrutiny recently for greenwashing claims um, a couple of different times is H&M. They've been previously sued for misleading consumers about the sustainability of their products and certain product lines. And really, above all else, consumers want brands to make sustainable products both more accessible and easier to find. And these are the top two things that they wanted to see from sustainable brands. So our thoughts are to hear is that brands need to remove the guesswork and hard work from shopping sustainably. And an example of a brand that does where this kind of really comes in from is one of our guest speakers this afternoon. They score products based on how sustainable they are. They do product comparisons and more. And their comms are also educational and can help people make informed decisions about the products that they need. So now that we've looked deeper into sustainability, let's move on to our second topic, which is clean. So we tease this a little bit in section number one with our talk about clean talk and trendy cleaning products. 50% of consumers are actively seeking out clean products, but there's a lot of confusion about what clean actually means. And we're seeing this across clean beauty, clean eating and more. In addition to greenwashing, brands are now starting to be accused of cleanwashing as well. And this means that they're calling their products clean, but they actually aren't explaining what that means. And 57% of consumers aren't clear on what clean means in the context of products and brands either. And what we found is that people are most likely to associate the word clean with chemical free. So when we asked them what their thoughts were on what clean actually means, 55% assumed it meant chemical free. 53% said healthy, and 53% said organic. So being chemical free is also what's most important to consumers. And when we ask consumers which of a series of clean associations was most important to them, once again, kind of chemical free came up as the number one, followed by health and sustainable. I personally found this stat to be fascinating because chemicals can be clean. 
chemicals have got a really bad reputation for being kind of scary and toxic, but that's not necessarily the case. I love the tweet on the screen that breaks down the chemical components of a tomato. It sounds scary if you don't know what it is, right? And sorry, it's tomato for the Americans. <laughs> Even though there's a perception that we need to avoid chemicals, that's not always the case, depending on what the chemicals in products are and what they're used for. So for this thought starter, we think that brands need to educate consumers on what they mean by clean and then back it up with the proof. Because clean is an unregulated term. It's gonna mean something different for every brand. So brands need to be really clear on what it means for them and what they are doing about it. And a great example of this, of course, comes from our other guest speaker today, Genexa. I'm going to let Emily tell us a little bit more in a couple of minutes. But as you can see, they do a great job of explaining exactly what they mean and defining what clean means to them right on their website. And they go beyond simple defin uh, definition and breakdown of what these terms mean for their products. They actually list out all the things that are in Genexa products and why they're included. And they also list out what will never be in Genexa, making it really simple for consumers who are looking for certain ingredients to either consume or avoid to know exactly what they do or don't want in their medicines. And while the planet is still important, as we saw that come up earlier in our presentation during sustainability, the primary motivations for shopping clean are actually a lot closer to home and more emotive. So the top reasons for buying clean were number one, keeping my family safe. Number two, protecting the environment. And number three, encouraging healthy consumption. So you can see that family kind of really comes up two of the top three purchasing drivers in clean products. So our final thought starter is that clean brands should connect on the emotional level and show that their purpose is to protect consumers' families. And really what's more powerful of a purpose to do than protecting families and really keeping them safe? And once again, we can see Genexa leaning into this in their communications and their social media. They have a lot of parents giving testimonials, talking about why they want to give it to their children, why they want clean medicine, and how they don't want those unnecessary dyes, artificial sweeteners, and more. So, in conclusion, consumers want to see tangible elements of sustainability, and they care more about the waste of a product than what the cause might be and how it's produced. So brands should really focus just as much on the product's future as they do on its past and how it got here and came to be. Also, consumers say the worst thing about shopping sustainably is finding genuinely sustainable brands. They wish those products were more accessible and easier to find. So brands need to kind of remove that guesswork and that hard work from shopping sustainably. And for clean, there's confusion around what clean really means. Most consumers associate this with being chemical free, even though chemicals can be clean, like the tomato. So brands need to educate consumers on what they mean by clean and then back it up with the proof in order to avoid any kind of accusations of clean washing. And motivations for buying clean products are close to home, with family safety being consumers' top priorities. So brands should connect on that emotional level and show consumers what their purpose is in helping them protect their families. So with that, I'm gonna bring on today's extra special guests, Emily and Lizzie, to help us unpack what this means for brands. And just a reminder, please drop any questions into the chat box um, on your screen and we'll answer as many as we can as we get to them today. Fabulous. All right, well, welcome to the virtual stage. Um, let's get to know each other a little bit better. So Emily, we're gonna start with you. We'd love for you to tell the audience a little bit more about yourself um, and your background. Sure, and first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk about this topic. So I lead brand marketing at Genexa, which is the first clean medicine company. So what that means is we make medicine with the same effective active ingredients as other brands, but without any artificial fillers. And this has been something that's been really important for me. I've always been interested in social impact and really began my career focused on health nonprofits and realized that that model of 
fundraising and providing programs and services wasn't sustainable. And so I started to pursue options to drive both social and financial returns. And luckily was able to join Genexa at the very beginning before we even had products. And today mm -hmm. we've created a new category, clean medicine, which didn't exist before. And it's been amazing. Fantastic. We all love your products, Emily. <laughs> And Lizzie, we'd love for you to introduce yourself to the audience. Well, to echo Emily, thank you so much, Katie and Susie, for having me. I'm excited to talk about this as well. I have been in the sustainability space since I was 16, um, really passionate about climate mitigation in the private sector specifically. So after I got an MBA and a master in environmental management, I worked at Unilever, both in their supply chain and on their sustainability team. And I found this frustration with both friends and family, but also companies, that it was really difficult to cut through all of this greenwashing um, that you've been describing so well. So I started Finch to cut through this greenwashing and give accessible real-time data for everyday products. So Finch provides data solutions for CPG sustainability. We've scored 1.6 million products in over 160 product categories, and then provide expert product analyses, transparent scoring, and then faster, better data for companies that want to set goals and, and measure progress towards sustainability targets. That's awesome. All right, so we'll start with our first question. Nice and simple. What do you think it means to be or to have a purpose-driven product? And Lizzie, we'll start with you. To me, a purpose-driven product is one that's made sustainably simply, and my definition of that would be manufacturing a product in a way that meets the needs of our current population without compromising future needs. Um, when using that definition, it can be pretty all-encompassing. I don't think a purpose-driven product necessarily has to have a second purpose pro besides providing utility to consumers and shareholders like Bombas buy one, give one, or the Dove Real Beauty campaign. Those are fantastic, and we love to see when that happens, um, but not necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I agree with that definition. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. I'm like, I'm I'm going to tap onto that. I think that purpose sometimes can be twofold. So, again, you pro providing utility to the consumer, but also the product is built inherently with that business model and impact model in mind and can scale. Great. So as we mentioned in that presentation a few minutes ago, consumers are interested in the waste that products do or don't produce. Um, so how are you thinking about the kind of the future life of products? And Emily, obviously, we know that you own your own products. And Lizzie, for those that you rate, um, and Lizzie, we'll, we'll kind of start with you again here. Sure. When thinking about waste, I think it's really easy to think strictly about end of life but it actually includes so much more than that, really starting with how a product is designed and then continues all the way across the value chain. So we account for a lot of factors ranging from, you know, how recyclable are the materials that are used? Do they have a buyback program? How likely is it that this product will end up in our waterways or sit in our landfills for centuries? You know, one example is that for most conventional disposable diapers, they don't decompose for 500 years. So thinking about the fact that the diapers our grandparents were in are still in landfills um, kind of makes you rethink the whole waste idea. Yeah, that's a crazy thought. <laughs> Emily, what, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I'm shocked. <laughs> um, you know, OTC medicines are, when not properly disposed, can also end up in landfills and when they're flushed down the toilet can end up in our wastewater sources as contaminants. And so one of the ways we're thinking about the future of products is by creating a drug stewardship program that aligns with several states recycling standards so that we can safely recycle and dispose of medicines at no cost to the consumer. So it's still in the works for us, but um, I'm excited to share more about this priority in the future. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Um, for the both of you, what do you personally look for when you're looking for sustainable products? And Lizzie, we'll go back to you again. I think what I personally look for is, is really aligned with what we do at Finch, which is scoring products based on six different footprints. So that's climate, water, waste, human well-being, raw materials, and ecological footprint. So just to pose with what we were saying about waste, while it's great to think about waste factors of a product, it's also important to not forget other impacts, right? Um, a metal straw doesn't end up in the turtle's nose, which is fantastic, but it's likely to require some fossil fuels, um, which contribute to climate change. So 
One of the things I personally depend on are claims that can be backed by real data as well as certifications. So some general ones I look out for are B Corp certified, EPA Safer Choice, Forest Stewardship Council Verified. It's so awesome to see that Genexa has a couple of these in their products like B Corp and Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Um, there are tons of specific ones depending on the product category you're looking for. And Finch is a great partner to, to sort of understand which certifications are meaningful and in what context. Yeah, that's awesome. And great that you're a user of your, your product. Um, and uh, what about your thoughts, uh, Emily? Yeah, I think the certifications make it really easy. And for me personally, simplicity first. If it's too complicated and I don't understand how this product is sustainable, it's going to be more difficult. It's If it's an obvious signal like, oh, I could reuse this bottle this way or here's how to recycle this. Um, I think this company, Imperfect Foods, does a really great job of communi communicating that to the users. So when you get your box of produce, you open it up and they tell you exactly what to do with the ice packs, with the wraps, with carton. So that makes it really easy for consumers like me to close the loop on the, on the company's sustainable mission. Yeah, it's so key. I have the three trash cans and I'm often kind of like, I'm not sure which one it goes in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what about brands that are just kind of starting to dip their toes into sustainability? What advice do you have for those companies who are trying to produce their own kind of purpose-driven products? Um, and we'll start with you, Lizzie. I would say the best advice I can give is to not get overwhelmed by all the different factors and things that you can do and find ways to really narrow it down. Focus on one or two sustainable features. We're in a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and really nail those before moving on. I think what we've seen is that boiling the ocean doesn't always work um, or really doesn't even usually work. And so um, we help companies sort of from day one say their sunscreen, we can tell them to focus more on ingredients versus packaging, et cetera, which has been really helpful for them. Yeah, definitely plug, work with Finch for sure. <laughs> Emily, what are your thoughts uh, on those brands that are just dipping their toes in? I agree completely with Lizzie. And again, it comes back to simplicity. And I would also think about when you're at the concept stage of a product, what is the entire journey from concept to the consumer's hands and how are those stages going to impact sustainability? So I always like to think of glass containers. We think of those as the most sustainable component for a product, but they're really heavy. So if you are shipping your products from LA to Atlanta and traveling across the country, do those negative externalities outweigh the positive benefits? Yeah, it's a constant. There's all those kind of things to, to think about all at the same time. Um, and thinking about kind of when we're making those, or when consumers are making those purchase decisions and at that point of purchase, you know, we talked a little bit about the word clean being unregulated. Um, and any product could just have the word clean. Um, but how can consumers really cut through that noise and, and find those products that really do meet their clean criteria? Lizzie, we'd love for your help here. This is really the reason I started Finch, as I mentioned, the amount of buzzwords that mean absolutely nothing continues to grow. And unfortunately, we're not seeing enough regulation in the United States. Um, green, eco-friendly, chemical, chemical free, all natural, Katie, that you alluded to are just a few. I would say there are kind of three main ways one can make sure companies are really walking the walk. The first is to look for companies that have been certified for a third party. We've talked about this before. Um, Secondly, companies that conduct their own life cycle analyses have proven that they're actually investing in the science behind sustainability and not just the marketing for it. And finally, I do want to note so many companies can't afford a B Corp certification or any type of certification or pay for an LCA, which can be pretty expensive. So for those smaller companies, one of the quickest ways to find out really what they're up to is in the materials and ingredients and look for information on how the product was made um, or even where the product was made. You know, the closer to you, the fewer emissions associated with the transport of that product. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and Emily, would love to hear, you know, obviously this is a key category for you. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the word clean. Absolutely. So, you know, clean is a largely consumer driven movement. And as you mentioned earlier in the slides, it can be a little confusing. And even those ingredients that are sciencey and chemical sounding could actually 
not be how they're being perceived. Um, so at Genexa, we like to think of clean in terms of broader categories, kind of zooming out into things that are in medicine in the inactive ingredients, such as dyes, sweeteners, preservatives, flavors. And so once you familiarize yourself with those categories of ingredients, when you turn over those labels and start to read them, it's much easier for you to decide for yourself what is a natural or organic ingredient versus what is synthetic or artificial. So I think the definition of clean will inherently vary across categories because what you put on your skin will differ from what you ingest in food or medicine. So there are already steps though being taken that I think are really great. And one of those is through partnerships with the retailers. So if you're a Target shopper or a Whole Foods shopper, when you walk into those stores, they make it very simple for you to identify what is Target clean, or you know that Whole Foods has a list of ingredients they just don't allow. So I think that the retailers are also helping consumers kind of understand this new concept, but it does, it is a little obtuse. Yeah, I think it's that, that trust and transparency is so important. Definitely. Um, so our data found that consumers are purchasing clean products with their family safety in mind. So let's pivot a little bit from the science over to kind of the emotions behind it. How do you think brands can connect with their consumers kind of more on that emotional level? Lizzie, we'll start with you again. I would say one way that it doesn't work to connect is using scare tactics. Um, I think, you know, the amount that we hear about aluminum and deodorant disrupting your endocrine system and things like that, that doesn't get very far. Um, I think rather transparency is key. You know, Emily's mentioned this a couple of times. If you come across an honest, trustworthy organization, you can connect with people. And I think telling a story about who makes your product or where your cotton was grown, for example, can go a really long way with the consumer. Yeah, and plays back to that piece about the checking where it was made. That's so key as well. Yeah, And Emily, what are your thoughts on that kind of emotional level? Yeah, I think, I mean, in medicine, it's a very emotional category, especially for parents with newborns or young kids. You know, you're, you're asking a parent to put a medicine, a drug into their child's body. And so that can be a very emotional moment. But I think for us, what's been really successful is that our business was built personally. It was built out of the need of two dads who had just had their own kids and were looking for products that aligned with their values. They were able to find clean in food and medicine and, or I'm sorry, food and personal care, but not in medicine. And so there is that moment when your kid spikes the first fever and you're like, what do I do? This product doesn't have the ingredients that I would normally want in food, but they have a fever. And so there is that pivotal moment. And so I think what we're really solving for is that gap between effective at reducing the symptoms and clean ingredients that align with the values. And, you know, it's really complicated to be a parent these days. And there's so many choices you have. And in the category of medicine, there weren't clean choices. And so that's what we're offering. We just want people to be able to have options and empower them to decide for themselves. And that creates a really strong bond. That's awesome. I love that origin story of the two dads. So tell us a little bit more about that kind of core consumer. Who is shopping Genexa? Yeah, they are avid label readers and um, consumers who are already avoiding artificial in other categories. So um, they like to research. They're generally on this path to live a more health conscious lifestyle. Parents, no surprise, tend to really over index on these mindsets when shopping for their kids. But you know, we offer products for adults and kids as well so that the whole family can kind of switch over to this clean medicine cabinet. Yeah, that's awesome. And how do consumers typically kind of discover your products? Yeah, we are a little bit of a different brand, a little more modern. You know, we launched in the age of social media. And so for us, social media and word of mouth have been really key. Before Genexa, clean medicine didn't exist, but you know, consumers didn't even know that could have that you could have clean medicine. But once you know, you can't unknow. And so I think that message is kind of spreading through parenting communities and also you know, your friends and your family and your personal circle are one sphere of influence, but also your healthcare providers, your pediatricians are another really trusted voice. So we're proud to work with pediatricians to give them information so they can decide to recommend clean medicine as well to their patients. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, before um, I knew that we started working together, I didn't even think about what was in medication. I'm like, oh, the doctor gave it to me. This is what I take. And so it's it's such a unique category. And now I'm significantly more mindful. Um, so where are people typically shopping for your products? Is it in store? Is it online? It's everywhere. You know, after the pandemic or during the pandemic, our shopping behavior has shifted so much. And so you can order our products online at Walmart and go pick it up. You can preemptively shop on Amazon. You could stop into a CVS or a Walgreens on another shopping trip. Or if, you know, your child has a fever, you're popping in there. And our goal is really to be accessible and available to our consumers so that they're never they're never without that choice. Now that we've provided the choice, we want to make sure it's available for them to choose. Yeah, for sure. So Lizzie, thinking about Finch, I know that you recently changed your business model and went from kind of just a consumer website to really focusing on B2B. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about that kind of evolution, what led to the change and how it's going. Sure. This is really hot off the presses that we just announced this earlier this week. It's been a really exciting shift for us. We discovered that we can have a far greater impact on the climate crisis far more quickly by focusing on serving businesses, um, building a consumer audience for Finch, which w took a really long time. Um, and so instead of, you know, investing in that, we can leverage our best in class scores to really drive product innovations and deliver insights to a much larger audience by partnering with brands and retailers that already have these platforms. CPG brands and retailers have long expressed challenges in accessing the right data needed to set, measure and report on their climate commitments. And that's exactly what we have to offer. So questions ranging from how much more sustainable are the ingredients I'm using versus my competition or how worthwhile is this certification versus this one are, are and things that we can answer. Yeah, that's amazing. And how have you guys kind of maintained that sustainability ethos through that kind of shift in business model? Honestly, our core work hasn't changed at all and sustainability is still at the core of it. Our IP has always been our scores. It's really just who we're marketing to, who we're serving. So this is an opportunity to get even closer to the ethos by getting our actionable data in front of a wider audience of decision makers. Yeah, it's going to have such a bigger influence on that shift. It's going to be phenomenal. So let's talk about kind of authentic marketing. So we talked a little bit in the presentation about greenwashing and clean washing. So what do you think brands really should be doing to avoid that kind of accusation of greenwashing or clean washing claims? Lizzie, we'll start with you again. I would say that unless you're defining it so concisely like Genexa is, um, the best approach is really to avoid words that just can't be backed up in any way. I mentioned a few, but some more, you know, chemical free, all natural that we've mentioned. We like claims like made without or free from where a detergent, for example, can say made without phosphates. And then you don't really have to sift through the ingredients list to make sure something isn't there. The easiest way to avoid greenwashing claims is really just to make sure every word is sub is objective and not subjective. Yeah, super simple in, in a way. Um, and Emily, what about yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same camp. It's all about that transparency and substantiation. So defining it for consumers provides that full transparency and allows consumers to decide for themselves, like, does this product meet my standards? So, you know, I talked earlier about kind of thinking about ingredients in terms of categories. And so when we define clean medicine as same effective medicine, we tell you what categories we don't have, no artificial fillers, that's all fillers, but we can even dive down no dyes, no artificial sweeteners, no artificial preservatives. We could even dive down a step further and go through all of the ingredients. But the point is that we're able to substantiate what we're saying. And I think that provides the transparency consumers need to make that decision. Yeah, for sure. So how important do we think that kind of the packaging claims are when it comes to green and clean? Lizzie will uh, obviously have done a lot of research here. I would say real estate is so limited on a package that what companies decide to say or show is incredibly telling and important. Placing a third party verification logo is a lot more meaningful than just using a buzzword. Um, I would also say don't be fooled by green looking packaging. It's been amazing the research we've done that show that consumers are more drawn to an earthy brown package, even though they're just seeing a color, right? Um, or something that has an image of the planet. It doesn't mean it's anything special. Yeah, for sure. Just green packaging with some plants on it. And I think it's been fooled in the past, for sure. 
Um, and Lizzie, do you factor in brand labels and marketing when you're doing your rating scores and rating those products? Really only if we can meaningfully back them up. We would never take a phrase into account like eco-friendly packaging. Um, for example, we don't score medicine yet, but if we were scoring Genexa, we wouldn't account for their medicine made clean label. But looking at their certifications and their materials and ingredients list, I'm confident they would score highly. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> So think about kind of what's next. What do you anticipate the implementation you know, with, of regulations around the definitions of green and clean? And do you, can you foresee some of those things coming in the future? And Lizzie, obviously, this is again key for your area. I do see it coming in the future, but not fast enough. It's happening in the EU with really exciting greenwashing regulations. And the US is normally five to 10 years behind this type of um, action. Mm -hmm. I'd love to not have to wait for government regulation, but rather find a way for companies to all be working off the same playbook when it comes to this. I remember a specific conversation I had with Allbirds when they were starting to put carbon footprint on their, um, on their shoes publicly. And I'm paraphrasing here, but they said, imagine walking into a grocery store and seeing that the only thing with calories or nutrition facts was on the butter was on one butter brand. Right. That's really not helpful when trying to compare products. And so Allbirds and other companies are taking it upon themselves to label, but still really using their own methodology. This is happening in makeup with Clean by Sephora and Credo Clean Beauty. They're using different measurements. And so Finch is really working hard towards driving the standardization of this. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting because in the EU, we're obviously very strict on food packaging as well with mm -hmm. calories and fat content and percentages and color coding labels and so on. A friend of mine just came to visit me here in the US and she was really confused even by some of our kind of food labeling. She's like, wait, what's the serving size? Is this too much? Not enough? What's the percentage? And so it is, it reminds me of kind of the, yeah, the food packaging. If we didn't have those claims, we, we really wouldn't know. Um, Emily, what are your thoughts on, the, on this area of regulation to what could be regulated in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think what Lizzie just talked about is very exciting. This is a huge gap area, and I think that it could be filled through government regulations or through third parties. So right now there is no kind of standard certification for clean or for green, um, but this would set clear standards within categories. It can differ between beauty, medicine, food, et cetera, but I think it sets a bar that allows everyone kind of a, a even playing field and then adds that layer of trust and authenticity. Yeah, for sure. And I think while we wait for kind of government regulations to come, you know, consumers really vote with their wallets. So we'll definitely start to see that that shift. Obviously, you know, given some of the data we saw, it's incredibly important to consumers. So what do you think is going to be the next big trend in this space, Lizzie? I think it's this. I think what, what we were just talking about, it's this consistency above among product categories um, with how they measure sustainability and impact. Yeah, great. And Emily? Um, I just see that there's still opportunity to continue expanding sustainability and clean into other categories. So I don't think we're done yet. We started in food, beauty, I'm probably getting the order wrong, but food, beauty, personal care, now medicine, but there are still so many categories ripe for disruption. So I think in the next 10 years, this will really start to become the thing. Yeah, for sure. I can foresee consumer electronics potentially coming up at some point. I did see a question actually from the audience that did actually ask a little bit about this, which is how do consumers feel about plastic neutral certifications? Lizzie, is there any data you have there? I don't have data off the top of my head. Um, we don't incorporate it into our algorithm. I don't think that necessarily means it's good or bad. Um, it's just there are so many certifications out there. Um, that's not one that we've that we've explored deeply. Yeah, and as well, we're kind of on that regulation piece as well. Another question from the audience um, is: Is are there any regulatory organizations out there regulating clean claims in any other countries that you're aware of? Not that I know of, Emily, have you heard of any? No, I don't know either. Goes to show we have a long way still to go, <laughs> for sure. Um, so speaking of that, what is that one thing that you hope changes when it comes to purpose-driven brands, Lizzie? And it sounds like maybe a plastic regulation. <laughs> plastic regulation would be great. Yeah, again, I am not 
hopeful for the government, unfortunately. And so I would just love to see companies take ownership of their social and environmental impact and become as transparent as possible. That's really table stakes for any brand. It's not just purpose driven ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Emily, what do you uh, what, what, do you, what do you hope to see? Yeah, I think just like with clean and green purpose, there is a risk that purpose washing, I have, I don't even know if that's a phrase yet, but that purpose washing could start to occur. And so what I'd really love to see is more purpose driven brands banding together to scale their impact so they can still remain competitive in their categories and achieve strong business goals. But when it comes to impact, if several brands share the same objectives of sustainability or helping people or even helping animals that they would band together in ways that could scale that impact further. And I just think that that would be amazing because I don't, what I don't want to see is for brands to say, Oh, you know, purpose-driven brands, they drive higher profits. That's what people are really globbing onto. And then for that to become an area of risk as well. Yeah, for sure. So what do you think is an action that everyday brands can take to make their brands kind of more purpose focused? Um, Lizzie. I think simply it's to be exceptionally data driven and make your decisions strictly around what the data is out there and what your own product data is saying. Yeah. And Emily? I think it's all about listening to consumers and putting those insights into action. So these movements are driven by consumers. They're telling us what they want and what they need. And so, you know, if brands are listening, they're on the right path. Right, right, for sure. So we have a lot of questions from the audience I'm going to ask. And actually, it kind of ties into that topic. So consumers indeed are saying, and we're seeing it in the research, that they care about sustainable and safer products. Um, but do you have any data or are you seeing any data that shows that they're actually converting to purchasing these products versus other options? And obviously, I think Genexa is a good example of where it didn't even exist as a category previously. Is there other data that you have? Um, I think you can just look at the category data and just see how it's growing. So, you know, there's still the OTC market is obviously quite huge and we're competing against really large legacy brands. But if you look at the growth year over year, the products that have more natural and organic and active ingredients or come with certifications and, you know, are really close to consumer are gaining market share and we're seeing those sales increase. And so, like you said before, consumers right now are telling us with their wallets until we have more regulations in place. And so I think it's interesting to just watch how categories are growing, what percentage share these clean brands and green brands are taking. And it's pretty telling. Yeah, for sure. Um, a lot of the people in the audience were shocked by the diaper stat. So, and the thought of my grandparents' diapers um, is definitely in my head and will not leave. Um, so what do we think we can do around that kind of recycling education to really help consumers understand um, that kind of, you know, that, that how long different products do take to break down? I think recycling is especially challenging because it's so driven by the municipality, right? Um, I wish that there were a federal body that could say, here's what you can recycle and here's what you can. But, you know, between my town and the town next door, there are some that recycle pizza boxes and some that don't. And so because of that confusion, it's really difficult. And so this is a perfect example of really starting on the local, hyper local level of spending 15 minutes, just calling your town, looking at the website and figuring out what's happening um, in your sort of micro environment. Yeah, yeah. This reminds me, um, small personal story of my childhood in the eighties. I have twin brothers who are younger than myself. Um, my mom only used towels so we didn't have disposable diapers and that washing machine was going every minute of every single day we didn't have a dryer so all those towels were hung on the washing line in our backyard so all my childhood photos of me in the backyard playing around have all of these kind of <laughs> homemade diapers that are hanging uh, hanging up there but, um, a little more sustainable but indeed it was the washing machine that was having to go kind of non-stop all day as well exactly and that's a perfect example of you know it's super helpful from a waste perspective but when you think about the water used and the energy to drive that washing machine when you're changing twins oh my gosh 20 times a day um yeah. it's pretty meaningful right and i was two in there once so i was probably still in diapers myself as well if we had a dryer it would have been energy costs through the, through the roof for sure, sure. 
Um, great question from the audience, which is how does the recent push for employees to start returning to offices impact the environment? And do com commuters use more kind of one time use products and plastics for packaging of food than when they're working from home? Is there any data around that? We did a blog on this a couple of years ago, and it was so fascinating where, in fact, we found that working from home actually was more detrimental for the environment because when you get the freedom to work from home, people were moving out of New York City when they were taking the subway, public transportation, moving to places like Vermont where they needed to have a car and have a bigger house instead of an apartment. Um, they needed their own office equipment as opposed to using the economies of scale of an office. And so that was the last sort of research that I did on it, which I found fascinating. And I'm not sure if the implications would be reversed as, as we go back to the office. But I, I do have to think that it's probably a good thing. Yeah, that's I didn't even think about that. And again, as I think about it, my work from home, I have the AC running all day when I work from home. Mm -hmm. And if I'm in the office, everybody's benefiting from the AC and so on. Right. It's really interesting that's kind of you know flipped on its on its head of the way that I think most people were thinking. Um one question came from the audience again really important topic is we'd love to hear um you both talk about the interaction between that kind of accessibility in terms of price and sustainability and clean so it definitely does seem like a lot of clean sustainable products are way more expensive so what are your thoughts on kind of the future of, of this area yeah i think that is a perception and there are things that brands can do to align their pricing with their consumer and not make them astronomical. You know, you can purchase Genexa products at Walmart alongside store brands or other legacy brands and you won't find that the price is that astronomically different. Um, but I do think it comes back to scale. So, you know, having access to more sustainable and clean ingredients and being able to share that scale with other brands could help drive prices down. And I also think what isn't seen is necessarily the profit margins of companies whose products are cheaper. So while it is more expensive to make clean products, it's I think those brands are really doing what they can to make sure that it's still accessible for consumers and the products that appear much cheaper, there is, I suspect, a large margin at play. Mm -hmm. Such a great answer, Emily. And I would add, I love this getting this question because I always ask back, more expensive for who, right? For the end consumer, sure, maybe you're spending more money. Um, but when you look across the supply chain, how the farmers are treated, how the manufacturers are either getting exposed to harmful chemicals or not, um, there are a lot of negative externalities that come with selling a t-shirt for $20 as opposed to $60. And so, um, obviously this is focused on the consumer and we like to see accessible and also sustainable products. Um, it also means that that generally the workers are treated better along the way when things are more expensive. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's better, ch cheaper for whom or more expensive for whom, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, another question came from the audience is, you know, I feel like a lot of larger companies are trying to make really honest efforts and make positive, although, you know, albeit kind of incremental changes. Um, they, of course, are trying to adapt older products and they lack that nimbleness of a startup who's starting from scratch. So. With that said, how do you define when those companies are greenwashing and where do you kind of really draw the line for companies who are really trying but uh, could potentially be accused of greenwashing? And Lizzie, I will start that with you. Yeah, it's such a good question, but a tough one to answer. I think I generally like to look for companies that have actually done or made progress and been honest about that progress. I love nothing more than when a company says, we had a goal to reduce our emissions by 30%, we only reduce them by 20%, as opposed to in the next five years, this is what we will do. Because really that doesn't mean anything. It's like, you can say whatever you want. It's, it's did you meet these goals or not? Um, and then looking at, you know, there are little tricks that I used for, for Unilever for working at a large company. Um, how many third party logistics companies are you working with where you're, that's not being incorporated into your footprint? Um, things like that, where you really get, get, can get down to the nitty gritty. And, and Finch does a lot of that hard work in the back end um, so that other companies and retailers don't have to. Yeah, I think that's really interesting around the idea of transparency and what have you already done? What do you still have left to do? I think greenwashing is really 
when that isn't included in the conversation and that transparency isn't there. So if a, a brand were to put out a product and just say, it's clean and not really back it up with that definition, not really talk about what is what is your definition of clean or if they're like, now it's sustainable. Well, if only the outer carton is sustained, you know, I think it, it just requires a bit more transparency around the definitions, the steps that have already been taken and acknowledging what's still left. Yeah, yeah, this reminds me a little bit of working in food and beverage in the UK, though it's not to be products that said 20% organic. I'm like, 20% <laughs> organic, it's, yeah. But I think in this case, it's really, it, uh, Lizzie, I really liked your example of we had a goal of 30%, we're only at 20, and that's okay. We're at 20, that's better than zero, and we're making the try that. And that transparency um, is really key um, for some of those larger brands. Amazing. All right, well, I'm going to thank Emily and Lizzie so much for being wonderful guests today. It's been amazing to spend the last almost hour with you. I want to thank the audience as well for taking the time to listen to us today for all your questions and interaction. It's been a phenomenal conversation. We will make sure that we share the recording and the deck with you all afterwards as well. And we hope to see you again next month. Thank, Thank you so much. Everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.